For 40 years, this was the house where John lived. John Aspinall, gambler, eccentric, animal lover. And this is the dream that John had all his life, the dream of a haven for some of the world's most threatened species. And these are the creatures who made up that dream, contained in surroundings as close as can be to their natural habitat. Their care has been profound and sometimes surprising. Their lives, the stuff of daily drama, red in tooth and claw, both at the end and at the moment when, as with this elephant, they labored to bring a newcomer into the world. For the final three years of his life, John Aspinall struggled bravely to beat cancer. It never weakened his resolve to protect endangered species from their greatest enemy, man. We try and go against this tide uh, with, 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 with reckless courage. We go against the tide, knowing there are no rewards at the end, there are no medals, it can only cost one money and effort and energy, but what else can one do? And anyway, it's decreed that one does that. I feel that I'm determined in that sense. I don't have a choice. I can't not do it. I mean, how can he win? How can anybody beat mankind? The game Aspinall played all his life was to win money through his gambling, investments and business deals to help raise the four million pounds every year that it costs to run his two enormous animal parks at Howlett's and Port Lim in Kent. That he did so successfully, first at the Claremont Club and latterly at Aspinall's in London, made him unique in the world of animal conservation. Scores of species and hundreds of endangered animals are alive today simply because of his dedicated, even obsessive efforts. There are 72 species protected on the 500 acres in the two parks. Nearly 25 tigers, the elephants, over 50 gorillas. There's no one else like Mr. Aspinall. There's no one else would do this. There's no one else that will create a place like Howlett's with the sympathy and the love of, of uh, the animals that are here. It's an absolute sort of beacon of hope for the way I think zoos in the future should be run. This is the way to keep black rhinos. They can do 40 miles an hour. This is the sort of space they need. It's, it's common sense. So it's, I think it's the way forward. And what a great example. What fabulous animals. He gives you the opportunity to become very good in a certain field. And you can get on and well, try things out and make mistakes, but hopefully get better from them. Everything he's done, he's done contrary to the way most established wildlife parks and zoos do them. And I think for years he was hated for it. And, um, which is probably a good sign, because it means if you're being hated for it, it means you're probably being successful at it. And he was successful at it. And, uh, you know, that's very courageous. I mean, I look at that and, I, you know, it's one of the things I admire about my father. He'd like to be remembered as, as someone who's devoted a very large proportion of the funds at his disposal and all his time, energy and energy and imagination and love to his, uh, to, to his animals. I mean, he was a sort of uh, secular St. Francis. For Aspinall, rich as he was, wild animals were neither pets nor fashion accessories. His passion to protect them emerged in the 1950s. The first tiger he ever bought was Tara. It was the first step on his life's journey to try to save endangered species. Tara was the founding female of the whole group. I bought her in a pet store 
I was uh, 29, and I just made some money. And so I went off shopping. And I went to this pet store and uh, bought Tara, who was oh, very young, six weeks old. She was born in Edinburgh Zoo. I also bought two capuchin monkeys and two bears, Himalayan black bears. And I had them in a built in 93 Eaton Place, where I lived. They had a small garden, very small. I built an enclosure in there and put the whole lot in there. The bears, the tigers and the monkeys. Well, I knew this arrangement couldn't endure. What did the neighbours say? Uh, <laughs> well, the, I used to only take my tigress, Tara, for a walk at night. And it's very gloomy, Eaton Square. To this day, it's got very, very dark. I used to take her on lead, and everybody thought she was a dog. They never stopped to look, and it was a tigress. There was a sort of dictator of a dog in Eaton Square, which belonged to a man called Bluey Mavrolian. And uh, this particular dog saw Tara with me 200 yards away and thought, ah, you know, there's an easy customer. He was charging down, full charge, and didn't realise it was not a dog, and she tried to break, but on the, uh, on, on, on the stone pavement, it's difficult to break. And it kept sliding right up to Tara, and Tara killed it with one blow of her paw. I didn't know what to do. I didn't know who owned the dog, by the way. But I killed the thing outright, broken neck, and I slid, I slid the dog into the dark part of an alley and just left it there. And I didn't dare tell. And later on, I heard that Bluey Mavrolian was missing his dog, and I didn't dare tell him. Until 20 years later, that my tigress had killed the dog. And uh, I think it was that incident which uh, encouraged me to come looking for a house in the country. So that's when I bought Harlot. Aspinall brought his family and his animals to Howlett's in 1958. I paid the deposit for this place, and I was wondering how I could find the rest of the money. And uh, there was a horse called Prilone running in the Cesare, which is a long-distance handicap. So you could almost say the house was bought on a winning bet. He renovated Howlett's and kept it as his private world for 14 years. He was born in India, son of a colonel in the British Army. My father and uncles would go to their clubs and they'd all get drunk and play billiard. And my mother was typical of her class. She was a very affectionate mother, loved me and my brother. She preferred me. Why was that, do you think? Well, because I was a love child. <laughs> and mothers nearly always prefer their love children. And a love child arouses their protective instincts more than a legitimate child. Because a legitimate child has the father, and the love child probably has the animosity of the father. It's a big difference. Did you sense that animosity? My father, Colonel Atwell, was completely emotionally indifferent to my brother and myself. So I wasn't selected out to be ignored. He ignored us both. No hugs, no kisses, no dandling on the knee. Um, no little games, nothing like that. I never really had a father, so I didn't know what a father's role was. I thought all fathers were like that. John Aspinall was brought up in East Sussex and educated at rugby school. The only signs that I was interested in animals was that I had tame jackdaws. I even took one of these to school, which caused some amusement. And I used to love ferrets, because ferrets were half wild and could nip you back. And I rather liked the concept that they could have a mind of their own. At Oxford, I read English. I didn't read zoology or biology, thank God, because I know my mind would have been filled with nonsense if I had. The one thing he did learn at Oxford was how to gamble. It intrigued me, the interplay of personality and character and the cards and the luck. I was obviously drawn to it. And we found, with our training as being very poor people, stood us in good stead. Some of the undergraduates were very well healed and played recklessly, and some others got drunk quite often and didn't care. And, you know, naturally this was good, uh, was good for us. At the weekends, he went home to Framfield Grange in Sussex. His mother had left Colonel Aspinall and was now married to Sir George Osborne. My family were utterly impoverished minor gentry 
Framfield Grange had 11 places where the rain came straight through and all the children had buckets to catch the rain. I'm the youngest of six children, four of whom are, are Osbournes, two are Aspinalls, and certainly the four younger Osbournes were very keen for him to tell us stories. He's a wonderful storyteller. He used to arrive with armfuls of half-crowns and two-shilling bits and throw them in the air for scrambles, and all the children, we didn't hold back. We'd all rush around, gathering up as much as we could off the ground, screaming with delight. Every week, John Aspinall inspected his animal kingdom in East Kent, often driven by his third wife, Lady Sarah, his companion for nearly 30 years. His marriage to his first wife, Jane, lasted 10 years. To his second wife, Min, only six years. When you reflect on that, do you find a feeling that you failed twice? Oh, no, no, not at all. Um, my first marriage was very in positive for two or three years, and then the excitement of the life we were living um, went to my wife's head and she started to take stimulants and depressants and alcohol and uh, she more or less crumbled never losing her looks or anything but uh, she fell to pieces and uh, I had no alternative but to unload her but she had left me with two beautiful children my eldest son, Damien, and my daughter, Amanda. That was a marvellous gift for me. And my next wife, um, in our brief uh, life together, Min, uh, I look back on with um, pleasure. We had a velvet divorce, never a problem, and she lives now in Scotland. I still modestly look after her. You lost a daughter. Yes, I lost it. Yes, that was a great sadness, Mamina. And she thought she couldn't breed for me after that. And there may have been something in this, because she went off and, with another man who married her and knocked out three children, twins and another child, quite quickly. So maybe we didn't click very easily. He married Lady Sarah in 1972. She looks after me so well when I was ill and when I was well. I don't think I'd have survived without her. Every week, together, they fed the gorillas from the top of their enclosures, simply because, in the wild, it's often in the treetops that the gorillas find their food. And what's that you're giving them? That is muesli. Muesli? They're such a placid animal. It's nice if you get a little squabble, because it's important for them to get emotional extremes, like quarrels and love and... Too much placidity is not the best thing in the world. Aspinall found his animals far less complicated than human beings. His relationship with his mother, Lady O, herself a fierce gambler, was an interesting one. My mother was a very dominant woman. She dominated me, really, for a long time. Um, I don't think I was uh, liberated from my mother's authority uh, until I was about much later than the average young man, 22 or 3. She was a, a, a real matriarch. Um, you would cross her very reluctantly. In fact, you probably I can't imagine that I dared cross her more than three or four times in my life. Aspinall confronted his mother on at least one occasion when he found out that he was a love child. She, as she mopped her eyes, she looked at me through them, so bleary now, and said, you can't blame me. You must never blame me. I said, blame you, darling. So I wouldn't be here today. If you hadn't wandered off with some magnificent male, you know, I wouldn't be around. So how am I going to blame you for it? must be mad, Mama. I'm thrilled that you did whatever you did. But where is he? What is he? She said, he never answered any of my letters. That I wrote to him five times. For mo I said, what for? Money, I suppose. He said, yes, of course, darling, for money. And he never answered any of the letters. So Aspinall determined to find his true father. He went to Somerset House to search for his father's birth certificate. Eventually I found him. It gave all his, uh, from Ensign McElroy Bruce right up to Major General McElroy Bruce, with GOC Nigeria in the war. And um, 
So anyway, he was general, so I thought, that's not bad. He set out to discover where this General McElroy Bruce lived. I came to this address, which was apartments for retired officers. It had a brass plate with a colonel this and major general that. They said, Major General McElroy Bruce. I think it was the third floor. And I climbed up these barley sugar steps. <laughs> Greasy black steps, oh God. The door opened and I was in the dark. And his face was under a sort of pinkish glow. And I could see very clearly Dorian Gray like myself at the age of 60 something. A an extraordinary feeling. And he said, Who are you? He couldn't even see me. I said, uh, I'm your son. And he never answered. He just pulled me inside and put me in the, under the lamp. And he himself disappeared into the darkness. And he thought, he looked at me for a long time and said, you're a Bruce, all right. And then he says, you must be Polly's boy. Polly was what my mother was called when she was in India. He said, this is cause for celebration. And we had a drink and uh, we immediately got on well uh, together. It was a biological thing. We had no difficulty with each other at all. You know, I admired him. He liked me, so it was a good start. Unfortunately, he lived a few years, and he died at age 70, I think. But we had a very pleasant time together. I had his genealogy traced. I was very proud to discover that I was of Viking stock, because they were always exactly the type of people that I would admire. <laughs> John Aspinall always had an unshakable belief in his own ability to succeed, despite any evidence to the contrary. The only career that I can remember John having was he was sent out to sell the Encyclopaedia Britannica, and he gave up after six weeks having not sold one. <laughs> so that was, I think that was his, his CV, would have to say that, and then gambling. I stumbled on a method of surviving by giving professional gambling parties in 54, giving chemin de fer parties and taking a tax on each winning bet. I think the gambling gene definitely comes through the mother's side. My mother was a great character in his private game. She did all the food. So when he gave a chemin de fer party in London, in the private houses, she would provide wonderful buffets. Her game pies became famous. People used to ask for her pies. She had a very special sauce that she used to make, and uh, other dishes she was skilled at. <laughs> and uh, she was all part of the act. <laughs> By 1957, Aspinall was holding perhaps 20 gambling parties every year in some of London's grandest private houses. Then, suddenly, it all went wrong. One evening, through the front door, at about 1.30 in the morning, when the game, the Chemin de Fer, was in full swing, came 23 policemen in their dirty raincoats and uh, read out from a piece of paper the charge. Habitual gaming on the same premises constitutes running a common gaming house. And my mother said, common? How dare you? He said, the only common people here are you. He said, particularly with those raincoats. And she turned around to the butler George and John. I said, George, John, take the coats of these gentlemen and hang them in the hall. <laughs> and he did. It was 1958. When the trial came on, it attracted a lot of attention. Of course, the police had not read the Gaming Act of 1845, under which we were being prosecuted. And um, we won it because the word habitual saved us. They had to prove that we ran habitually a game at a certain address. And this was the second time that we'd ever used these premises 
for a game, and then they changed the law. <laughs> I forced them to. The Aspinall reforms they were referred to, and I was the Lord once. I was very proud that uh, they were referred to like that. Two and a half years after the act, I opened uh, the Claremont Club in Berkeley Square. Though he gambled successfully in the casinos of London, his methods in caring for his animals were criticised as gambling with human lives. Aspinall always believed in a process of bonding. When they bond, the keepers go into the cages of the animals they know well, like tigers. Not a head rub. Nick Marks was in charge of Aspinall's cats at Howlett's for 30 years. I have about 10 that I'm, I can go in with. We're allowed in with one tiger per person. This was a little thing that she worked out herself. When I, um, in fact, several of them do do it. When I was used to be allowed to clean the enclosure with her in there, um, I used to fluff the straw up with the rake and she'd realise that I'd be, if she jumped on there while I was by the shed, that we would be on a similar level, our heads. And of course, that's the way they greet each other, with a head rub. Um, and that's obviously with their friends, that's the way they would like to greet their friends. So she'd jump up on there for a head rub. That's, she's bright. Was the paw heavy? No, no, she's gentle. I mean, you know, they're not pussy cats, but you know when they're getting rough. <laughs> Once again, like other great truths, which bonding is one of the great, and modern truths, because there wasn't really much known. The beneficial effects of it were relatively unknown before. Stumbled upon by accident. Don't, Don't do that. Ever. <laughs> In 20 years, five keepers gave their lives to this Aspinall credo. Mark Aitkin and Darren Cockrell were killed by elephants. Brian Stocks, Robert Wilson and Trevor Smith were killed by tigers. Balkash is a young, vigorous male tiger. He killed Trevor Smith in 1994. My guess is Balkash jumped up on Trev. He's a huge tiger and Trev went down and struggled to get up, and then just instinct took over. Um, Balkash is a tiger, um, and just instinct took over. He couldn't help himself. What did you feel for that animal at that moment? Pond's too small, isn't it? Same as I feel now, love. Killed your friend? Just one minute. Yeah, he's my friend too. Balkash is my friend too. Canterbury City Council took Aspinall to court to stop the keepers going into the cages. Then we won the case. I, I said that in any great campaign, you know, like bonding with dangerous animals, you're going to lose some foot soldiers, and I got awful trouble immediately the QC opposing, representing the council, let to his feet say Mr Aspinall described this man as a foot soldier like it was an insult. Well, I don't see... <laughs> I, and it wasn't meant as an insult. I mean, I, I, my father was a soldier. I was a foot soldier in the war. I never rose to commission. I never got a commission or anything. I was just part of the, you know, fodder. And I mean, that's it, to me that that sort of a person is one of the highest types to be a foot soldier in a great campaign. <laughs> if I ended up a casualty, purely, I mean, it won't happen. But if it did, so what? If doing what I believed in um, caused uh, the end of my life, then big deal. As Mr A says, we're all foot soldiers. Um, I think that probably includes him. In court, I was asked, well, I hope you know, this sort of thing will never happen again. I said, it's absurd, I can't possibly say that. It's like saying to your son, you can drive on the roads, there'll never be any more accidents. I mean, it's just ridiculous. Well, we're keeping 1,500 animals, and mostly, many of them so-called dangerous ones, powerful ones like rhino, elephant, tiger, bison, and so on. You know, you're going to get the odd accident, a human error, and so on or miscalculation of a character. We take every precaution we can think of, but uh, the bonding goes on. Aspinall was himself guilty of a miscalculation that almost cost him his life. He was bonding with his bears. I used to play with Aisha and Esau. They used to like to tuck my neck here. But one day, I suddenly realised Esau, the male, was in a filthy mood, and with a great roar, he came for me. So I ran, 
and I took off my leather coat and threw it at him. Unfortunately, he spent about a minute tearing it to pieces in rage. I kept shouting for help. I tried to jump out because he was coming for me again, and I landed like this on the side of the enclosure and then sank down. At that point, Brenda Michael Richard Parks arrived with my mother-in-law. She had two, two saucepans in her hand. She'd been doing cooking the lunch. She banged these together, and that scared him off. And uh, they pulled me out. And I was so frightened that I was sobbing. When I got out, I sobbed on the sofa because uh, I thought my last moment had come. Aspinall's logic for his action and beliefs was simple. In the war going on between man and beast, Aspinall was firmly on the side of the animals. The battle is for the earth. There's a great battle going on now between human short-term need, I won't say greed, but short-term need fuel, or whatever you like to call it, wood, fuel, sweet water, and there's a fight for these, and um, the man is facing the whole of nature, facing down nature. Everybody who thinks about it realises these species are doomed by us because our population and our power is explosive. The humans who have anything approaching my position are numbered on the sort of fingers of one hand. <laughs> what chance have we got? I mean, I've never for a moment thought we would win this battle. His obsession three times brought him close to bankruptcy. He had to sell practically everything to pay the bills to keep the animal parks open. The whole place was going to go down the tube at one point. I had to sell most of the good furniture that I bought early on. All had to be sold. And there were probably several million pounds worth. And it did keep me going. I sold a lot to my friend Jimmy Goldsmith. And, I mean, that would be worth well over a million today. Sir James Goldsmith and his brother Teddy were friends of Aspinall's throughout his adult life. Politically, Jimmy shared Aspinall's right-wing views and together they fought a parliamentary election. Teddy Goldsmith admired John Aspinall's determination to conserve the environment. There's no other zoo like that in the world. I think obsession is a good word, you see. It's just uh, uh, this whole thing, you need to be obsessional to make any progress in uh, in the area we're involved in, in environmentalism in general, and all its various forms. And I don't agonise as to whether I sell the table or not, but there's no other way but that. The furniture will go. In my will, I'm telling them what they should sell if things get really rough with my foundation, what is expendable. So we've got some very valuable garden statuary, and I think I'd tell them to sell that first. It would be sorely missed, but um, circumstances might arise. I don't think they will for, for a long time, because um, uh, my, many of my friends who are men of substance, and some of them are, have come forward and become patrons. If things get bad when I'm gone, they're there to help keep this place going. And that gives me a lot of comfort. Friendship was always a major consideration for Aspinall. Loyalty to his animals and to his relatively small, close-knit circle of friends. I live within a network of friendship. It's rather like the spider's web in the sense that those nearest the centre uh, are one's closest friends and then there's, you go further and further out. He's tolerant of human weakness and he will rate loyalty above almost everything. Loyalty was his uh, foremost uh, value. That's what he really believed in. Loyalty came first. You had to be loyal to your friends regardless of what they did. I'm not by, nat by nature um, a, a person who would automatically keep a secret. I'm rather the opposite. I can keep secrets, and I have kept secrets, but it's an effort. If I did something terrible, if I I don't know, murdered my wife or something, he would not approve of that. Uh, I mean, he, he loves my wife, but he would support me to the degree that, why did I do it, whatever, he wouldn't just drop me because I'd done something reprehensible. He would be lo a loyal friend. In one of the windows of Aspinall's club is immortalised in stained glass an image of Lord Lucan, 
who went missing after his nanny was murdered in 1974. It was persistently rumoured that Lucan consulted Aspinall immediately after the murder. Aspinall always denied it. As far as he knew, he said, Lord Lucan died soon after he abandoned his car near New Haven in Sussex. And as far as he was concerned, that was the end of the matter. Aspinall always had a deep mistrust of science, but he resisted it in his pioneering attempts to re-establish the long-extinct Barbary lion. No one, not even John Aspinall, knew how pure this strain is. They came here 20 years ago from America, where they were graded A, B or C, depending on how many characteristics they had of the original Barbary lions. They were the lions involved centuries ago in the one-sided battles with Christians in the Colosseum in Rome. To find a purebred, grade A Barbary lion would be a revelation. He <laughs> wanted to make sure he gets both pieces. Aspinall and his team are cooperating with a project aimed at finding the DNA of Barbary lions. <laughs> Scientists are digging up old bones under the Colosseum. They're attempting to find a DNA fingerprint, if indeed they can tell a Barbary lion is distinct from other kinds of subspecies of lion, then they'll be able to match it up with um, DNA from hair follicles and blood DNA and to tell us how pure our lions are. You set any store about this business of trying to get DNA from bones under the Colosseum? <laughs> well, I'm never nothing against that. It is certainly would be uh, Moroccan lions, North African lions, mm. if they do find any. We've always kept to A and B and bred A with B and avoided the C's, who were those who at least had the fewest characteristics. We think that if there are any Barbary genes in these lions, they should be protected and it should be increased by breeding A's with B's and eventually A's with A's. And you should get back from back breeding something of the original lion. Come on, Ado. Come on. Perhaps surprisingly, John Aspinall was never honoured in Britain for his unique work in preserving endangered species and returning them to the wild. I'm not a courtier by nature. I haven't got the virtues that courtiers need. Right sense of social timing, where to stand, where to sit, sense of hierarchy, a sense of what is the right thing to say and what isn't at what particular moment. Uh, we give the gorillas much the best Swiss and Belgian chocolate because they're more discerning on the chocolate than the other. All these niceties are outside my kin, so I never bothered to try and match myself against those who are skilled in this field. This is the ordinary common chocolate eaten by human beings. The world is crawling with social climbers who'd love to be knights or... or life pairs or something, or get CBEs or OBEs, or, but such a thing would have no interest for me. I'd rather have a black rhino birth than any of those things. The East African rhino is one of the fiercest creatures on Earth. Now so rare, Aspinall nonetheless built up a herd of 20 over the years. Berry White is in charge of Aspinall's rhinos. Can you feel the calf moving in there? I haven't done with Etna so far, but with Rukwa, before she gave birth to her last calf, we did feel kicking. It's just high up here, really close to the end, like the day before. She seems fine and comfortable and happy in herself. I'd be more worried if her mood had changed, but she's, she seems fine at the moment. Despite failing to detect any movement in the womb, Etna gave birth on September 5th, 1998. 
Everything went according to plan, and on a sunny day, a fortnight later, mother and daughter ventured into the world outside. She's two weeks old today. Got a name? Uh, Tana. And how's the relationship between mother and daughter? Oh, brilliant. She's just being really protective. She's very aware of her being, you know, where she is. But, yeah, she's just doing everything right. It's quite funny, you know, we just sort of, we'll see her as being a big baby and then when you see them with their own young, they change completely in your eyes, you know. It's very exciting for you, isn't it, when something like this happens? Oh, yeah, it's brilliant. Especially with Etna, she's only five years old, so it's great to, it's great that she's given birth, but also to a female calf and, you know, at such a young age, it's, it's fantastic. First time birth. She's seen her. I suppose you could say she's seen calves here, being looked after, I don't know. John Aspinall did receive one honour during his lifetime. He was made a Zulu advisor. To be made an Induna is a title that I accepted and I revere highly. I mean, to me, that Induna ship is worth more than a knighthood. Chief Pusadesi flew from South Africa to see me in hospital. At that time, I had these radiation spikes in my cheek here, horrible things. <coughs> and the guests had to sit behind lead screens <coughs> and could, were warned only to stay 15 minutes. I had to tell them to leave because I said, gotcha, you've been here half an hour and you're only supposed to stay 15 minutes. That was one of the most extraordinary things in my life, really, that he should come all that way to see me. He, he prayed for me. And while he prayed, I called the ancient names of the Zulu kings. I called the names of the ancient kings. So I was really in semi-pagan uh, prayer, and he was he was uh, praying for me in Christian way, in a Christian way. Did you find that an irony? It's an irony, but it was very moving, because. Uh, his Christianity was uh, a genuine one. In his frailty in the last few years, Aspinall desperately missed the contact he'd always had with the animals with whom he felt such a kinship. A great cat, the tiger or lion, will be inactive anyway, 20 hours out of 24. And this is a wonderful provision of nature, that a creature so powerful Forget about man's t recent 10,000-year advance. Before that, the tiger was the absolute overlord of the forest, including the humans, uh, not very many in those days, in their little villages and so on, lived in awe of the tiger. And the tiger could do more or less what he wanted. Now, the fact that there are essentially an idle species is a great provision, because if they were like humans, like American businessmen, <laughs> active all day long, <laughs> Heaven knows what havoc they would have caused. I sense a certain sympathy in you for the idleness of the tiger. Yes, because I'm very idle myself. <laughs> and um, I was born idle, you know, a late riser. Um, I, I couldn't get... I, when I was younger, I would stay up very late gambling at night. But really, I'm, most of the males in my family are like the big cats. They, they work when they have to. The last five years of Aspinall's life were among the most successful in the history of the parks. This rare antelope is the bongo. He built up the biggest herd in Europe. Their head keeper is Paul Werdenham. He, in fact, was the second calf born in this enclosure. And that's his mother, just there, the one with one horn. He's born in 19... 96 March, I believe. He's all right. He's a, he's a good lad. We we uh, put a bit of time into him when he was a youngster, because obviously he's going to grow up to be this big and strapping. If you see the keepers with the bongo, you see the way that they come and nudge them and brush them out of affection, and then the way the keepers tickle them and groom them and play with them with their hands around their horns, and that's all messages are passed all the time. And it's, it's not easy to 
be able to be accepted by a whole bongo herd. I mean, a bongo is a very well-armed animal. And you can see them in there, and they're accepted as bongo by the bongos. Bongos think they're bongos. Friendly bongos, of course, in the herd. Herd members. Steady, steady. Nice and quietly. What do you feel for these animals? Good girls. Well, they're your friends, for one. You don't see them as the farmer would, because they see making money. If you get uh, one that's ill, you certainly start fretting a bit. There's certainly um, a lot of benefits you can get from being that close to them that you wouldn't do if you had bars or rail fences in between you all the time. What do you learn from them? Well, you learn them. That's what you learn. You, you learn how to be a bonker. Mm. You, you learn oh. how to move in a certain fashion, what they may like, what they might not like. You, you basically learn to be one of them. Yeah, there's a lot of sentiment at Howlett's. I'm very sentimentally attached to my companions in evolution that have been with us for 40 million years and experienced and survived all the terrible things which we had to survive when we were a modest and humble species. And they're our companions, and so I feel attached to them. They're part of my life, my culture, our culture. I'm forced into this position of being a protector from my affection for them as a species, my respect for them as evolutionary masterpieces. Everything that has survived till today is a masterpiece of evolution and is also within itself a fountain of knowledge and experience and, and we'll do anything we can to try and preserve these miracles. That is what drives us here. might well become, if it isn't already, the world's greatest breeding center for certain species, which we have specialized in. That is the extent of our ambition, which is very great. In his last weeks, Aspinall began to hand the responsibility for finding the four million pounds a year it takes to run the animal parks to his successor. To his son, Damien. The mother's very trusting, because normally They'd be a lot more protective. I wouldn't say I'm a gambler like my father. I've, I've probably gone the opposite way in so far as that I've been inoculated against extreme gambles. If you're talking about making money, I think there's plenty of people in, in the business world who succeed without being mad, rash gamblers. But four million a year is a lot of money. No. Four million a year is a lot of money, but um, I'm prepared to accept that responsibility as I know James Osborne is. The tomatoes? Am I optimistic about the survival of the wild animal parks? Yes. But I dread the near future. I dread what might happen after John dying, because however you plan things, things don't necessarily fall into place. Damien is very, very interested in Howlett's and Port Lim. Been summoned. And we also have a shared nephew called Amos Courage, who at this moment is in the Congo. We have an orphanage in Brazzaville, and we will be setting up a similar operation in Gabon. I think they'll be the first captive-born gorillas ever to have been returned to the wild. Amos has done incredible work, and very bravely, in the midst of warfare in the, in the Congo. And I hope and I trust that Damien and Amos and I will be able to hold it all together. My father's contribution is massive. He's effectively torn up the rule book gone against every established code of animal husbandry and, you know, succeeded where others haven't. The way you, I hear Dad described it bothers me that his life's work with conservation, if you ask most people, they'll say, oh, isn't that the place where keepers get killed? You know, it should be, isn't that the place where they look after 100 gorillas? Isn't that the place where we bred 70 gorillas? Is that the place where we bred African elephants? Is that the place where you breed clouded leopards? Is that one of the greatest Langer collections in the world. Um, that bothers me. But, you know, I think my father's greatest honours come from the animals. I think they honour him, and I think that's all he needs. I think when he goes and sees his animals and the reaction that he gets from his animals, you know, that's his honour. That's his greatest honour. They honour him, as he honours them, but they honour him. I have an instinct to protect and this instinct finds expression in what I do for the animals. 
My family are pretty well capable of looking after themselves. And this way, that instinct is satisfied. There's no other colony of these monkeys in the world. I don't need an approval from the gods that what I'm doing is the right thing to do, because I know it is. Which is East African variety of rhino, East African race. And she's had how many calves successfully? Four. Four. I do feel that the gods are holding my hand. As I approach my end, it looks as if we will have the financial muscle to survive the two parks. That's what I mean by looking after me, looking after all the animals that depend upon me. Come on, look. Quite a lot of goodness in chocolate. This brown bread's probably better than that white stuff to be. But we can't choose what the baker gives us because he charges us four points a loaf. It's all before the sell by date. We don't buy anything after its sell by date. There's a lady in Cumberland makes these especially for the gorillas. They're the best toppings you can ever have. That's not the way to eat them, you silly boy. Silly boy. He'll be remembered by his London friends um, and, I suppose, enemies as a very lavish party giver, wonderful host, great storyteller, and, you know, this rather strange thing he had with animals. He'll be remembered um, by other zoos who are all fairly mystified how he's so unscientifically has done so well in breeding animals that they haven't bred at all. He'll be remembered by wild animal lovers with great love for what he did. And I'm sure he'll be mourned by, by his animals. Here, I've always got something to do, and every day is a joy for me. It's here where I'm happiest. My spirit rests here. Whatever I'm doing is, is going to become more and more necessary as the years pass. Um, so I, I don't feel that I'm, I'm following the wrong pathway. It's just that the pathway is so rough that I may not be able to reach the other end.